biological information, the membrane code. We've been talking about the book Biological Information, New Perspectives, um, edited by several intelligent design people and Bruce Gordon, who's a self-organizational theory person, uh, published by World Scientific Publishing in uh, 2013. Uh, should have been Springer, but they uh, backed out of it at the last minute. Uh, some proceedings of a symposium held in uh, May and June of 2011 at Cornell University, organized by John Sanford. Um, the book itself is available on the internet, all the chapters. Uh, this morning, uh, you can buy the book in hardcover as well, but it's very expensive. Um, you're, you're giving the company a donation, and I think that's a fine idea. I did it myself. The uh, book itself starts out with a general introduction, information theory and biology, biological information and genetic theory, theoretical molecular biology, and uh, biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. And right now we're in the theoretical molecular biology uh, part next to the last chapter. It's called The Membrane Code, a Carrier of Essential Biological Information that is not specified by DNA and is inherited apart from it. It's by Jonathan Wells of the Discovery Institute. Um, the abstract reads, according to the most widely held modern version of Darwin's theory, DNA mutations can supply raw materials for morphological evolution because they alter a genetic program that controls embryo development. Yet a genetic program is not sufficient for embryogenesis. Biological information outside of DNA, excuse me, um, uh, outside of DNA is needed to specify the body plan of the embryo and much of its subsequent development. Some of that information is in cell membrane patterns which contain a two-dimensional code mediated by proteins and carbohydrates. These molecules specifically target uh, or specify targets for morphogenic determinants in the cytoplasm, uh, morphogenetic determinants. So basically they work with DNA. Generate endogenous electric fields that provide spatial coordinates for embryo development, regulate intracellular signaling, and participate in cell-cell interactions. Although the inter individual membrane molecules are at least partly specified by DNA sequences, their two-dimensional patterns are not. Furthermore, membrane patterns can be inherited independently of the DNA, as we'll see. I review some of the evidence for the membrane code and argue that it has important implications for modern evolutionary theory. And we'll look at that. Introduction. According to the most common version of evolutionary theory, genetic programs encoded in linear sequences of DNA are sufficient to control the development of embryos from their basic body plans to all aspects of their morpholo morphology and physiology. You change the DNA, you change the uh, embryo, and all the information is included in DNA. Major evolutionary changes would then depend primarily on changes in genetic programs. Although a few biologists are critical of this view, some evolutionary development uh, developmental biologists have recently argued that interaction transcription factors in gene regulatory networks support it. For example, Eric Davidson writes, the body plan of an animal, and hence its exact mode of development, is a property of its species and thus encoded in the genome. Embryonic development is an enormous informational transaction in which DNA sequence data generate and guide the system-wide spatial deployment of specific cellular functions. Because development of the body plan is caused by the operation of ge uh, genetic regulatory networks, evolutionary change in the body plan is change in GRN structure occurring over deep time. According to Sean B. Carroll, given that development is controlled by GRNs, it, is fo it follows that the evolution of development and form is due to change within GRNs. I have presented the case for genetic, by the way, that's his ellipses, not mine. I have, um, uh, not Sean Carroll's uh, 
Jonathan Wells. I have presented the case for a genetic theory of morphological evolution that can be condensed into two statements. Form evolves largely by altering the expression of functionally conserved proteins. And two, such changes largely occur through mutations in cis regulatory regions of mosaically pleiotropic developmental regulatory genes. Basically, the changes occur through mutations in DNA that codes for protein or that codes for regulation of protein. On occasion, Davidson and Carroll have both acknowledged that GRNs act within pre-existing spatial domains, but they argue that such spatial specification can be neglected and the GRNs are the principal factor in development. I'm not reading this straight through. Those are my ellipses, by the way. Um, anything in yellow is mine. And skipping over another paragraph, yet uh, GRNs cannot differentiate one region of the embryo from another without spatial information that is specified beforehand in the fertilized egg. Evidence for this comes from a, vari a wide variety of animals. The need for spatial information prior to localization of gene products. The maternal segmentation and Hox genes in embryos of the fruit, fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, comprise a genetic regulatory network. Yet that network be depends on the prior establishment of the embryo's first body axis by polarized cytoskeletal rays and spatially located targets already present in the oocyte. Those polarizations and localizations, in turn, derive from prior asymmetries inherent in the ovary. So the proteins are made, but they already know where to go based on what the cell looks like internally. Spatial information also precedes and directs the GRNs and embryos of the nematode um, C. elegans. The sperm centrosome first establishes an anterior-posterior axis by initiating cytoskeletal changes that produce a polarized distribution of zygotic proteins. Where the sperm, sperm enters the egg makes big difference. These in turn lead to asymmetrical cell divisions and subsequent differentiation. They don't all uh, turn into the exact same cell. They change into different cells depending on where they are and where they are partly depends on where the sperm happens to enter. In ascidian or sea squirt oocytes, the cortex, that's the cell membrane plus underlying cytoplasmic and cytoskeletal elements, already contains spatially located morphogenic determinants that specify the primary axis of the embryo. That's the head tail. Upon fertilization, the sperm centrosome induces cytoskeletal changes that reorganize those determinants and establish the second or dorsal ventral axis. That doesn't say exactly where, but in the next one, the oocytes of the frog Xenopus uh, lavis have also have a primary axis before the sperm enters. The sperm establishes a secondary axis by aligning a microtubule array in the zygote that directs morphogenic determines to the future dorsal side of the embryo. So where the sperm enters will eventually become the back. Endogenous electric fields. <coughs> One way membranes can provide spatial information is by generating electric fields. Indeed, all living cells produce electric fields by transporting ions across their membranes. The sodium potassium pump it utilizes energy from ATP to move three sodiums ions out of the cell while taking in only two potassium ions. With each cycle of the pump, the interior of the cell thus acquires a net negative charge equivalent to one electron. So in the inside of every living cell is electrically negative with respect to its external environment. And the voltage across the membrane, the membrane potential, ranges from about 50 to 200 millivolts, mm, fifth of a volt maximum, uh, average about 70 millivolts. This produces a steady endogenous electric field in the 10 to 100 millivolt per millimeter range. Multicellular organisms and their organs are covered by an epithelium, 
a single layer of cells laterally connected by tight junctions that block the flow of ions. They're stuck to get each other at the sides. Epithelia are polarized in the sense that the ion channels on the side facing away from the organ or organism are different from the ion channels on the side facing the organ or organism. The result is a trans-epithelial potential that, unlike the transmembrane potential of individual cells, is usually negative on the outside of the organ or organism and positive on the inside. Most cells simply are negative inside and positive outside all the way around. These ones have a differential from the inside of the organism itself to the outside. The trans-epithelial potential typically ranges from 15 to 60 millivolts. So you all have an electrical field around you. Small, but it's there. Xenopus embryos generate endogenous electric fields from the single cell stage through at least the neurula stage. In the embryos of chicks and mice, large ionic currents pass through the primitive streak a furrow through which cells move into the interior as they differentiate into tissues and organs. In 1995, Rishi and Richard Borgens proposed that endogenous electric fields could both polarize the early embryo, pardon me, polarize the early vertebrate embryo and serve as cues for morphogenesis and pattern. If this were true, they wrote, at least five corollaries must be satisfied. This is what you'd expect from the theory, basically. Embryonic cells, number one, must be responsive to extracellular voltages within the range of magnitudes measured within embryos. Number two, disturbances of these endogenous gradients of voltage by imposed voltages in the physiologic range should result in developmental arrest or abnormality. You should be able to make the embryo into something weird by putting a wrong electric field across it. This disturbance should be most profound at the embryonic stage when endogenous fields are present within the embryo. Four, since the internal voltages are spatially polarized during development, the form of teratologic change, making the embryo into something strange, produced by an artificially imposed field should be predictable based on its orientation relative to the embryo's orientation. In other words, where you put the uh, electric field should matter to the embryo. And five, any technique that will reduce or eliminate an endogenous voltage gradient should lead to developmental arrest or retardation. And then they go on to say, all five of these requirements have been met. So people have actually done experiments putting little tiny electric fields on embryos and gotten them to do weird things. For example, applied electric fields in physiologic strength can induce and guide cell migration in vitro. You have little pieces of embryo that are being grown in culture and you can make them migrate. And notice uh, multiple references to that. Furthermore, targeted disruption of endogenous electric fields disrupt normal development in ways that suggest the fields are controlling morphogenesis. There is also evidence that direct currents in the physiologic range can affect gene expression. Skipping over a few uh, paragraphs. Membrane potentials and intracellular signal signaling. Networks of intracellular signaling molecules r regulate a cell's morphology, physiology. That's, I'm assuming that, that should have been fi and physiology. Um, they also interface with GRNs to regulate gene expression, and they mediate a cell's response to extracellular signals such as hormones and growth factors. Some of the more important membrane-bound signaling uh, molecules are the RAS proteins, so-called because they were originally found in cells transformed by rat sarcoma virus, otherwise known as RAS. 
RAS proteins are localized mostly on the interface of the plasma membrane, though they also, that's the outside of the cell, um, although they also occur in inner membranes such as the Golgi apparatus, they come in many forms. Human, in humans alone, the RAS superfamily includes more than 150 different members. It's a whole bunch of these that are very close to each other, but just enough different that they can serve as doing something else. Um, distinct RAS isoforms have distinct functions. The little differences make a big physiologic difference including the regulation of ion channels, cell migration, and cytoskeletal remodeling. Proper RAS functioning is essential to mammalian development, and its disruption has been linked to cancer, which, given that it uh, was uh, originally discovered in rat sarcoma virus, is not terribly surprising. In 2008, Angus Harding and John Hancock wrote that those circuits integrate and process signals to operate as switches, oscillators, logic gates, memory modules, and many other types of control systems. We're talking about the RAS proteins. These complex processing capabilities enable cells to respond appropriately to the myriad of external cues that direct growth and development. Harding and uh, Hancock identified common design principles, there's that word again, that highlight how the spatial organization of signal transduction circuits can be used as a fundamental control mechanism to modulate system outputs in vivo. The spatial organization of RAS molecules in uh, nanoclusters is essential to reduce noise and produce high fidelity signal transmission across the membrane. Now, remember, the RAS proteins themselves are made the standard way by DNA producing RNA producing protein. But where they go is determined by the way, uh, the structure of the cell. So spatial organization is essential to the proper functioning of membrane proteins. And those proteins can generate intracellular signals that regulate gene expression. The gene regulatory networks described by Davidson and Carroll are related to DNA information at one end and spatial information at the other. Neither source of information can be discounted. So you need both. Then there's the sugar code. Cell-cell interactions, including those in the developing embryos, depend on carbohydrates localized on the surface of each cell actually stacks of carbohydrates. Sugars can be attached either to lipids, glycolipids, or membrane proteins, and they can also be attached to each other in little uh, lines or trees. Because sugars can be covalently linked in a variety of ways, unlike amino acids in a protein, which are all linked by identical peptide bonds, the diversity of side chains on glycolipids and glycoproteins is enormous. In 1985, Ronald Schaar wrote, there appears to be a code on the surface of each cell that specifies its function and directs its interactions with other cells, a code in some ways comparable to the genetic code carrying on the DNA molecules inside each cell. But not quite, because DNA is done sequentially and always attached the same way. Whereas in this case, it is as if an A could serve as four different letters depending on whether it was standing upright, turned upside down, or laid on either of its sides. And more than that, you can actually have more than one uh, series that's joined to a particular carbohydrate. Hence, Joachim Gabius has called this the sugar code. So the sugar code carries essentially biological information in addition to that carried by DNA sequences. It is not known whether the sugar code can be directly inherited, but there's evidence that other cell surface patterns are heritable independently of DNA sequences. And of course, uh, Wells is suggesting that it probably is at least partly directly inherited. Some membrane patterns can be inherited apart from the DNA. 
So this is an example of why he said the sugar code probably is inherited. And this is his, probably one of his best examples. In the single-celled protozoa, changes in cilia patterns in the cortex can be inherited apart from changes in the DNA. In 1965, Basin and Sodenbarm introduced one member of a conjugating pair of paramecium, pardon me, induced one member of a conjugating pair of paramecium aurelia. Paramecium, you may remember, is a little organism in pond scum that is covered with cilia. To transfer to its partner a section of cortex that had been surgically inverted 180 degrees relative to the, to the surrounding cortex. That must have been some really demanding surgery. Um, the DNA was unchanged. Ciliates with artificially inverted rows have been stably maintained for thousands of generations. Now, whether they're better than the ones with the normal uh, remains to be seen, I suspect probably they're not. But the point of it is that that's not inherited with the DNA. The DNA couldn't correct it after thousands of generations. In 1977, Ing and Frankel reported similar results with tetrahymena piriformis. Frankel called this extragenic blueprint the corticotype. Similar results have been reported by, in tetrahymena by Nanny and in Stylonychia by Grimes. So, <coughs> excuse me, four researchers, three different organisms, reproducible in one organism at least. And you can just turn those little suckers around and they just, the organism multiplies with that turned around patch reproduced. Clearly, cortical patterns in ciliates can serve as their own templates when they replicate. In 1977, Albrecht Bueller reported that after mitosis in cultured 3T3 mice fibroblast cells, about 40% of daughter cells contained mirror symmetrical actin bundle patterns and performed directional changes in a mirror, mirror symmetrical way. So they're dividing and they basically make themselves mirror images of each other. He concluded that they quote, organizations of daughter T3T3 T3 cells form mirror images of each other, end quote, at the time of mitosis. And uh, it, continuing on to the implications for modern evolutionary theory. Clearly, the biological information needed for embryogenesis exceeds the information encoded in DNA sequences. RNAs and proteins encoded by DNA form gene regulatory networks that are essential for development. But those networks must be localized in spatial domains for the embryo to differentiate into various cell types and organs. And those domains must be spatially ordered with respect to each other for the organism to develop its proper morphology. The arrangement of proteins and carbohydrates in a membrane is analogous to a two-dimensional code that specifies many aspects of the cell's morphology, what it looks like, and physiology, as well as its interactions with other cells. Indeed, several membrane codes can be distinguished. The pattern of ion channels in the epithelium of an embryo generates an endogenous electric field that provides a three-dimensional coordinate system to guide migrating cells. The pattern of membrane-bound proteins, such as those in the RAS family, spatially organizes intracellular signaling and mediates response to extracellular signals. And the complex pattern of carbohydrates on a cell surface is essential for cell-cell interactions. And if the cell has cilia on it, it's important how they got there. Membrane patterns in ciliates are known to be heritable independently of the information in DNA sequences. And there is evidence that some cytoskeletal and membrane patterns in the cells of multicellular organisms can also be inherited apart from the DNA. Taken together, the data suggests that embryo development is not controlled by DNA alone, and thus the DNA mutations are not sufficient to provide raw materials for evolution. It's got to be more. <coughs> 
1983, John Maynard Smith defended the gene-centered view of development and evolution and asserted that the DNA-independent inheritance of cortical patterns in ciliates constituted, quote, the only significant experimental threat, end quote, to that view. It now appears that ciliates are not the only example of non-genic developmental information and DNA in independent inheritance. One could speculate that accidental changes in membrane patterns analogous to accidental mutations in DNA could provide the missing raw materials for evolution. Yet two and three dimensional information carrying patterns are likely to entail more specified complexity than the one dimensional information in DNA sequences, making beneficial mutations in such patterns much less probable than beneficial mutations in DNA. At the very least, Calculations of the time required for evolution will now have to take into account these higher dimensions of biological information. You have to involve not only the DNA, but also the rest of the cell. Now, my take. First, I'll point out that there are some other codes that aren't mentioned by the article, such as the histone code, uh, that are not DNA. I'm indebted to uh, Jeff Sonnenberg. Thank you for that observation. There appear to be another set of sources of information in the cell than the DNA sequences. Another whole set. Different kinds. The inheritance is not quite as clean as it is in the case of DNA, where we can see a specific code going to a specific uh, thing, but, but there is a general pattern that is important. In one sense, Darwinian, not neo-Darwinian evolution, can handle this set of sources, as it also, this set of sources also presumably has random variations which could happen and which could be selected. And if they don't make any difference, then they don't really matter for the uh, organism anyway. Although, to be fair, there's always the question of Sanford and genetic entropy that might also happen with extra genetic information. In another sense, this complicates the task of unguided in evolution. The origin of life becomes more difficult as we have to account for spatial organization as well as DNA content. And actually, if you think about it, that's been known for a long time. Because DNA, uh, if you produce a perfect set of DNA and you put it into a test tube, even if you put it into a test tube with uh, a bunch of the transcription and translation machinery and an energy source, you don't get an organism. You have to have more cell organization than just bare DNA and something to translate it. Uh, the appearance of organelles also, that is if you're going from let's say prokaryotes to eukaryotes and now you have a nucleus and you're going to have to deal with that or perhaps you're going to have to deal with Golgi apparatus or something like that. The appearance of those kinds of organelles must now include in addition to the organelles themselves the associated cytoskeleton and or membrane organization and information. So it's not just enough to have a little extra DNA. You have to actually have something that uh, somehow creates the organization, uh, the underlying organization itself. Now, some parts of the non-DNA code are relatively trivial. Uh, where the sperm enters becoming dorsal is I don't think that much of a big deal. The embryo has to have a dorsal side somewhere, and if it starts uh, where the sperm enters, that's fine. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's a, a big evolutionary step. Um, it's a small one, in my opinion. But there are other parts that are more critical. For example, the sugar code, which requires a whole bunch of moving parts, not just the sugar uh, sticking up there, but you have to have the enzymes that are going to attach the sugar and they have to know where they're supposed to attach it in order to make it work. And the RAS code is complex as well. So I don't see how 
it's going to be an easy job for random variations to give us the raw material that we need to get not only the DNA, but also this other information and to have them arrive in the same organism at the same time so as to create something new. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. <laughs> I can remember um, many years ago reading a uh, article that pointed out you took pine trees and you grew them uh, in a warm environment and then you uh, they <clears throat> did grew quite large. And you took them uh, up to a cold environment. And they grew much smaller. And then you take those in the cold environment and move them to the warm environment, and they still remain small. And uh, this was uh, used as evidence that. Uh, it's, it's more than DNA. It's the environment had affected the, uh, the system and so on. And this was, so I think, this is another example of uh, what we're dealing here with a situation which looks to be very much more complex than our, our simple minds seem to uh, have generated. Um, I can remember going to a set of lectures. Uh, it was a bunch of educators, physical education educators, uh, and I was sent to that. Uh, it was not my choice to go there, but I was sent to listen. And uh, one person there gave up, gave a lecture on how you know how simple life is, and uh, you know just just. Uh, have the right few few right things there and so on and you're going to have uh, reproduction and so on and his final words were uh, uh, the reason that we uh, think life has to be so complex is, is because we are so complex uh, this was the, the, the final this whole idea you know it, it was completely lost. Well, uh, what we're, we're dealing here with is uh, a, a situation that I, uh, you know, uh, things ter have turned out to be much more complex than, than we thought, and we don't know very much about it yet. Uh, now, where does this lead us? As uh, human beings, and in this great controversy between the Bible and science, uh, where does this lead? Uh, what is going to happen? How long is the scientific community going to keep on <coughs> ignoring this? And, and to, to add to the picture, uh, since nobody else wants to talk, I might as well say something. Uh, uh, these scientists that are spending all this time and energy uh, trying to find water on Mars as a suggestion that life might have arisen on Mars, uh, do they know anything about what, uh, how complex the cell is and so on? I, I don't mind them suggesting life on Mars could have been imported from somewhere else, but when they suggest that life could have, I mean, that, uh, uh, could have arisen by itself somewhere else, or in these these moons of Jupiter and so on. And you know they're they're looking at Saturn, looking all over the place for life, and uh, millions of our dollars being spent for this. Uh, I don't mind the information they they find, but uh, their goal uh, 
you know, finding life elsewhere there seems to me to be, uh, th this is, uh, uh, to a certain extent, ignorance in action. I hate to use such a pejorative term, but uh, man, we're spending an awful lot of money there uh, for somebody who's hoping to find life there. Uh, isn't the scientific community going to wake up one of these days uh, and uh, realize that, uh, no, uh, and a lot of scientists believe this, too. in fact, you know, uh, <clears throat> we have this Pew Research Report that says that 51% of scientists in their survey believe in some kind of guiding force or God. Uh, the, 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 the two different questions that they put together to get that figure. Uh, the majority of scientists believe in this, and yet we keep on this g game here of uh, which of uh, you know ignoring God. Uh, there's no way to find truth in case God exists. Uh, we, we anyway, that's my comments for my reaction to this, but I sit there and I'm puzzled. How long can this scientific community keep on ignoring all this data that they're generating? Well, I think there are a couple of comments that can be made. Uh, one of them is um, the pine trees that don't, that once they are acquainted with cold weather and don't grow very big. It makes a lot of sense if you're growing up in the, uh, let's say, the northwest or the, the, or the north of, of uh, either Asia or, or, uh, or uh, the United States and Canada. Uh, because, you know, if, if you're in an Arctic environment and you grow too big, you're, uh, you're a sucker for the next uh, wind that comes by and you know, snaps off your trunk. So you really don't want to grow that, that tall. By the way, the same thing happens at elevations in mountains. I, you know, anybody who's ever hiked up into a mountain can notice where the, the trees are getting shorter and shorter and then finally you get to where they're not there anymore. Um, It's actually, if it happens to be a particularly warm year, it's a good idea if the tree doesn't try to grow as fast as it can and really, you know, take off. Uh, or, or even a seedling that, that, that now tries to grow uh, rapidly because, you know, one or two years being warm is not, uh, is not enough to uh, protect you when the next really bad cold snap happens. So, it's kind of, uh, can you almost say designed that way? <laughs> um, it, it, makes, it makes teleologic sense. But of course, we don't allow te teleology in science. Um, and, you know, the guy who talks about the simple cell is whistling in the dark. Uh, I mean, if you look at the simplest cells we have, there's like 250 proteins or, or better. And, you know, you have to have all the machinery to reproduce DNA and to turn it into RNA and to turn that into protein as kind of a bare minimum. Uh, and that's just, that's hugely complex. And it's the kind of thing that if you want to say, well, you're going to get that by just random variations of some kind, is baloney. And now as it's turning out, which we already knew because, you know, all you have to do to kill an E. coli is to poke a hole in its, its cell membrane. And, uh, and once the integrity of the membrane is gone, um, the cell dies. So... Uh, You know, that's perfectly obvious. And, and the truth of the matter is that I, I think that this will not be solved until we recognize the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is that 
many of these positions are being taken for philosophical or either theological or anti-theological reasons. Either there is, a God, is no God or there is a God, but he wouldn't do things that way because if he does that, his hands are directly involved in human suffering. And that's really the bottom line. It's actually a, it's a theodicy. You see, God either doesn't exist because of evil, or if he does exist, he keeps hands off of everything, and evil exists because, you know, stuff happens. Um, I may have missed it. Did um, Wells at all address the issue of homeoviscous adaptation? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. For homeoviscous adaptation. Um, I didn't see that word in his chapter. Mm. What that represents is the cell's ability to regulate the proportion of um, saturated versus unsaturated lipids in its membrane in order to maintain the fluidity of the membrane at just the right level. Now that's a little bit of a trick because as temperature changes, as you know, fats have a way of behaving differently at different temperatures. As you know, so, when you have soup... So if, if I'm hearing correctly, what's happening is that if, if, it, if it gets colder, the cell makes more unsaturated that's correct. Methods, and then if it's warmer, warmer, then it becomes more saturated. That's right. In order to maintain the same fluidity of the membrane surface. Which is why palm oil will solidify, whereas uh, safflower oil, which is usually grown and, in much and colder climates, won't. And all of that is very much temperature dependent. Now, you see, if you're just storing lipids someplace, it doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> Unless Although you want you, to be you able to, get them. Yeah, yeah, unless you want to be able to access it. <laughs> uh, however, when you need uh, an interface between a living cell's inner environment and the outer environment, that interface must allow the communication to be dynamically uh, sent and received. And that means that you have to regulate that interface in a very uh, direct and deliberate way. It does not happen merely by slapping some lipid together to form a membrane. But of course, originally it did. <laughs> uh, the other thing is I'm wondering, mm, I, I may have missed it, but did Wells mention it all uh, the asymmetry of the lipid bilayer in the membrane. He didn't. Um, I would imagine that uh, some of that could happen by simply having the product start on the inside and then therefore only what uh, needs to pokes clear through. Well, it turns out that there is an actual energy requiring system that maintains the asymmetry of phospholipids on the inside versus the outside, so that the phospholipids that are represented on one side are not the same proportion of phospholipids on the outside. You, uh, you see what mm. I'm saying? That, y y as you know, equilibrium will set itself up if given a chance to do so, and you have to have an energy requiring system that continually monitors the distribution of the particular phospholipids and which way they're facing. So there's an actual protein that goes around and says this phospholipid belongs inside and it's outside, we're gonna flip it. That's it. Those, it's, it's an entire apparatus that just maintains the integrity of the membrane structure. Now I have a question for you then. Uh, does that go all the way down to mycobacteria or? All or living organisms. Including, uh, I'm trying to think of mycoplasma. 
I oh. don't know if somebody actually studied those. It would be interesting to ask that question because if that's the case, then it implies that uh, this is something along with ATP uh, synthase is absolutely required for every single living cell. And the difference between a living cell and a dead one in this respect is that a dead one is no longer able to maintain that asymmetry. And once you see the lipids that are ordinarily represented only on the inside showing up on the outside, like phosphatidylserine, then you suddenly discover, wait a minute, that doesn't belong here, there's something wrong. It would be basically like finding troponin in the blood. There's it's, the it's, insides it's, are leaking it's like out. It's a and signal on the outside this cell is dead or dying. Interesting. Now, I'm not sure you could call that a code because it's only, I mean, it's, it, it's either on or off kind of thing and it's always on. So it's, it's not like the sugar code where you have to put just the right sugars on. Uh, you notice but it's but it is it is one more complication that you have to maintain in the cell. It's in some sense like one of those fail-safe mechanisms in submarines, that you have to have everything running in order for the submarine to be able to dive. That that's the fail-safe mechanism. Unfortunately, one of the Russian submarines didn't have that. <laughs> so when it when it ran uh, into trouble. It sank instead. You, do, you wouldn't want that to happen. You, know? so, <laughs> you see, in this sense, a cell, as long as it is healthy and normal, it's able to maintain its surface so that all the other cells can recognize it as healthy and normal. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm curious, are there any mechanisms that go through and say, uh, this cell has too many phospholipids on the outside, uh, we need to kill it, or we need to start digesting it? Well, for example, what happens is if you get phosphatidylserine to show up on the outside, whereas it's almost exclusively on the inside, then the coagulation system kicks in and starts wanting to form a thrombus right there because it recognizes it as a damaged surface if that is what is happening on a surface of a blood vessel. And you get enough of that and you wind up with a huge clot. Well, that's right, yeah. Interesting. Is, is any of this implicated in things like heart attacks and strokes? Oh, certainly. So keep those phospholipids inside. So keep the right phospholipid in the right place. <laughs> well, any other comments, sir? Have we? Uh, this um, uh, situation of these pine trees I mentioned was uh, used as uh, an example of <clears throat> a Lamarck type of inheritance. And so this uh, whole issue of <clears throat> whether you can inherit acquired characteristics or not was in the balance. It, uh, the, the story is, of course, that uh, <coughs> Russian scientists, this is World War II stuff. <coughs> At that time, Russian scientists uh, used Lamarck to, to try and force some of their conclusions and so on. And they is this uh, Lysenko and company? Yes, exactly. And uh, <coughs> the battle is on and they were ridiculed. Uh, then you came with these pine trees, and they said, hey, uh, uh, 
maybe Lamarck was right that you could uh, pass on acquired characteristics and these pine trees were used as an example. I'm uh, just curious, and, uh, um, did it go on to the third and fourth generation? <clears throat> uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, the paper didn't uh, quote that verse. verse. Uh, <laughs> Although, as you know, other papers have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have here an issue that tells us, you know, and of course uh, we all thought, hey, you know, these Russians, they're, 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 they're such bad scientists and so on. So it was, you know, a, a, um, a uh, reaction to World War II and all this. Uh, but uh, two things. One, it tells us uh, that the sociology of science is influenced uh, very much by uh, political factors at times. Uh, well, it's also philosophical factors. You see, <coughs> if, if the DNA <coughs> controls everything, then I'm my own person. <coughs> and I don't have anything directly related to anybody else except as they gave me DNA. And, yeah. and that, means that, uh, that means that philosophically, <coughs> Uh, I can ignore what my parents did, what my grandparents did. Uh, they don't matter to me. I, I am a clean slate. I'm a tabula rasa. So if you're, you know, kind of a Rousseau type of person, this is a very attractive theory. Yeah. On the other hand, if you believe that, you know, the sins of the fathers are inherited, then it's a little easier to believe the pine tree stuff. Uh, you know, one of the things that's <laughs> happening is you have data and then you have people believing the implications of the data or not. Yeah. And people believe them partly on the basis of their previous <clears throat> philosophy. Uh, the, the second point I think that we can learn from this is that uh, uh, it's turning out that uh, it's not a question of uh, just our uh, acquired characteristics inherited or not uh, type of thing and that uh, we had too simplistic a model in the questions we were posing there and I think this is something that we all need to be very careful about and that is until we know the whole picture uh, things may be very different and furthermore much more complicated as we're finding out in the last 10 years or so much more complicated than we imagined they were earlier. And so uh, a caution is wanted here, but uh, the data is just so overwhelmingly in favor of uh, some kind of design uh, that uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, we need to be cautious on that point. It's, it's just becoming overwhelming. Well, I think one of the lessons that draw from this is that you don't have to be an idiot uh, or a totally unlearned person or wicked, I think is the other alternative that was used once, uh, or insane, to believe that there is good evidence for design and that it's reasonable to accept that as a, as a provisional hypothesis. Well, And I think that this is a really mm -hmm. important thing. Uh, there are far too many people that feel like, oh, if they, do, if they believe in a designer, they go outside of science. Yeah. And therefore, <clears throat> they, they must be ignored. And I think that that's but just wrong. The science is forcing us outside of science is what, what's happening yeah. here. Uh, but I would add to, to that, uh, it's not just a question of uh, saying, uh, uh, yeah, there's probably some kind of designer here somewhere. I do think there's enough scientific data out there, and this gets into the geology, <laughs> paraconformities, and all these widespread layers and so on. One does not have to give up scientific integrity to believe in creation. Well, there's, there's enough not data only, not out only. there, you don't have to do it. Not only paraconformities, but uh, genetic entropy. Uh, it would be interesting Regio to ask what happens to this stuff. Does it undergo the same kind of entropy without, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and argue for a short age for life on Earth? 
residual carbon-14 and so on. I mean, uh, the, the stuff is piling up. This dinosaur this, innards. <laughs> this uh, story that if you suggest creation, you're no longer a scientist. Uh, we need to come back to what science used to be before uh, Darwin. Uh, and that was, it accepted the idea that it was a designer. Yeah. S science needs, well, re needs to be redefined. It redefined itself. We need to come back to its original uh, definition. Come back next week and we're going to meet some intelligent design researchers who have actually made publications that have made a difference in science and uh, their view on intelligent design. Uh, and Gager and Douglas Axe uh, have the next chapter and I think it's a fascinating one. We'll see you next week.